All right, does that look pretty fam familiar to everybody in terms of how you go about manufacturing your projects? Pretty similar to what you guys are doing? Yeah? No? Oh, that's weird. <coughs> I assume that's exactly what you guys were doing. No, so uh, as we go through our EPICS projects, you guys tend to iterate through building prototypes and you build the final prototype and it's a prototype and you go and deliver your prototype, right? Very few of you will go into any kind of mass manufacturing or even small batch manufacturing of your EPICS project, right? Like that's a step you don't quite make it to. So when we talk about our, our design process, we, f we stop a little bit short, right? We go detailed design delivery. We, we never do a production or a manufacturer in the middle. Um, so what we're gonna talk today is just kind of a broad overview or a big survey of manufacturing really from a design perspective. So you could do your whole education on manufacturing, manufacturing technologies, how to make things. Uh, we're not gonna get that deep in, okay? I was a development engineer in industry, so I was on the design side of things, not a manufacturing person, but I worked with them a lot, and you have to come to learn some of those things and able to get your designs to be manufacturable in the end. So we're gonna be looking at it from that design perspective. Now, it's not to say that all of you who are in engineering are going to go on to be design engineers. Most of you think you will, because that's all we really teach, uh, unless you're in industrial engineering, and then my apologies. Um, so, so you IEs uh, get to see the whole other world of this. Um, but most of us are taught to be design engineers, right? Here's the design, solve this design problem. And the application of that design process is used by all the other types of engineers that are in the manufacturing process, just from a different perspective, right? Your customer is no longer the end user, your customer is maybe that design engineer that designed the part, you know, it's your company, okay? So it's a different perspective. So we're gonna go into just kind of a high, high level of that. I don't expect you to come out of this like, I know how to you know, make a casting or something like that. I just want you to pick up some of the terminology so that when you hear these things later on, you're not like, I've never heard of this before, what are you talking about? Um, and then hopefully as you get into your project, especially those of you who are on some of the entrepreneurial projects, you're thinking about doing a startup with something you've done in Epics, you can apply some of these ideas, okay? There is a ton of information out there on uh, manufacturing for startups. So if you are in one of those small business situations, I strongly recommend you do some research on that. So again today, very high level, um, how do I communicate my design so that someone else can understand it, right? Before I can ever go about trying to build this thing, I need to take what's in my, my head, that design thing that's in my mind, and put it on paper, create an electronic copy, something that someone else can understand to make something. Because as an engineer, especially if you're in, in design, most of the time you won't be making your parts. Someone else is gonna be making your parts, right? So if you design this clicker, you're not gonna go and mold all of these yourselves as the design engineer. You're gonna have other people do it. And you wanna exercise control over what they make so that you know it works, because you care about it, right? So uh, how, do you, how do you communicate your designs and control them so that when other people make them, you get what you intended, right? So it's about design intent. Um, we we'll talk about how parts are manufactured on a really high level. Uh, most of this comes from a, a mechanical point of view uh, because that's what I, I worked in orthopedic industry. I designed knee implants and instruments for total knee replacement. Those are pretty mechanical, okay? Um, if you're an electrical engineer, a computer engineer, most of these things still apply just a little sh bit shift in which direction you're coming to them from. Um, <clears throat> how do you make sure your part's manufactured correctly? So someone makes that part, how do you know that that part and what you intended it to do are the same? And then a little bit about cost, how design affects cost, okay? Um, so we'll get through that. So again, this is just kind of broad level overview. Don't expect you to have you know, application level knowledge of this at the end of this lecture. So first we wanna recap and kind of uh, put ourselves in the design process where we're at. So uh, can, can any of you remind me what are the steps of the design process? Brainstorming. Brainstorming, okay. Anybody else? There's more than one. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody remember the EPICS human-centered design process? It's on the walls in, in our rooms. It's on the web page. You should have all learned it in those introductory lectures you took as first semester students. Yeah, specific, specification, conceptual, um, anybody else? All right, we'll, we'll get to them in just a minute. I'll give you a refresher. These are things you should know by rote at this point. Um, anybody tell me what's a user need? Anybody give me a definition on that? No, Elena? Um, what your stakeholder wants from the product or the service that you're giving 
yeah, it's what the user needs, right? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. It's the primary features of your product, right? So I, I like to use example, if you're designing a car, right? If that's your overall system, you'd have user needs for all the little subsystems, but your overall needs for that car are that it can accelerate and decelerate and you can steer and you can put passengers in it, right? Those are those high level, like, if, you, if I asked you what you wanted out of something, you could give me those like really high level things, okay? Um, what about a specification? Can anybody define a specification? Like measurements, very good. So you're getting to quantitative. So it's like user needs, but you're breaking them down and putting numbers to them, right? So that car needs to go. Now I say it needs to go zero to 60 in so many seconds, right? So now I'm getting into a quantitative field. And those are things that you can, as an engineer, hold yourself to, okay? Or as a designer in general. Very good. So if we think about, about uh, where we're at today, so you started the project identification. Uh, we we kind of skipped over that one, get into the specification development. So that's what is this thing supposed to do? We do some conceptual and detailed design. This is where you get to be creative and where you all get stuck for you know, semester after semester on these projects. And then finally, you get to that final prototype that works pretty well, and you go into production. Okay? Well, the things we're going to talk about today about design outputs are the outputs of detailed design. Okay? A lot of you will say you're in detailed design when you're coming up with like the, what is it, your final design solution. You're really still in conceptual design. You're still trying to figure out how it's going to work. Okay? When you're in detailed design, you should be getting to the point of saying, how am I going to create this thing so it can be manufactured? I know the basic idea down pat. I'm getting to the really nitty gritty details. Okay? Um, so production is something that we really skip over in uh, ed educating you about Epics for the most part, because you don't mass produce most of what you make. Right? You make one of them for your community partner, and that's awesome. But sometimes there's a broader applicability of products. A lot of the projects you guys are working on would work for a lot more people than just your one community partner. Okay? And so you want to start to think about, how could I get this solution out to more people? And then you have to ramp up production. Okay? You have to be able to make more than one. So um, the design outputs simply define the design. It's that simple. So design outputs are any kind of documentation that specify exactly what your design solution is. Okay? So if you were coming up with uh, you know, one of the laser harps for Imagination Station, You've got a set of schematics on the electronics. You've got, hopefully, a drawing of the, the overall structure, the frame, the enclosure. Um, so you have assembly instructions. You have a list of the components that go into it, right? So those things are all design outputs. All of the, all of the things that come out of the design activities that are tangible, right, that you could use to create your, your product. Um, so examples of those, prints or schematics should be one of the most common ones. Those of you who are uh, going to go into some kind of mechanical design, your life will revolve around prints, okay? Um, so we'll talk a lot about those in some detail. Manufacturing routings. So manufacturing routings are the series of steps used to manufacture a product, okay? So if you're going to create, you know, uh, say the, the casing for this, you'd have to do a, you know, a step of molding, uh, a step of assembling this piece. You've got multiple steps along the way, and that manufacturing router shows you all of those. You'll have a bill of material. That would tell you what all the components are that go into this. Right? So it's kind of your shopping list. So if you think about these like, uh, like you're going to do a recipe, your bill of materials is the ingredients in the recipe, and your routing is the, the steps that you take. Right? So if you're going to make scrambled eggs, you've got to crack the eggs, put them in the pan, heat them up, do all these things. Those are the steps in the router. Okay? How you go about doing it. Um, labels and names, that's something that very few people at this level will think about, but your product has a name. Your product will have some identification on it, packaging, things like that. Those are all design outputs. A manual, if you have some instructions for the user. Inspection criteria. So inspection criteria are the list of things that you're going to measure or check when someone else makes your part. So those are part of your design outputs. And then any testing results. Those are things that define what your design is supposed to be. Okay? So those are some, some kind of broad examples. Get my clicker to work. Um, let me step back just a little bit. Um, so, print, so prints or schematics define the geometry of your design. Okay, so if you're creating an electronic thing, you probably have some housing for it. If you're creating a really mechanical device, you'll have the whole device um, in some kind of a print. So most of the time, our Epix teams get here. So you, you open up some CAD software, CATIA or SOLIDWORKS or uh, Inventor, some, some piece of software, and you model this thing. Okay, and you say, now I'm done. There, I've specified my design. But that's really insufficient, okay? 
because a lot of things could satisfy this design. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a print of this, and this is how you communicate this to a manufacturer. Right? If you wanted to go to a machine shop and say, make this for me, uh, except for the ones here on campus that are going to help you go through and do the cam with them, uh, they're going to want to know what you're going to measure on this part so that they can check that they've made the right part, so that you need a print. So this is a simple assembly that I created of a slap hammer. Okay? A slap hammer is a really fun tool used in orthopedics. Um, where you would take the top, uh, top left end up here, you'd attach it into some component that was stuck into someone's bone, and you would uh, slide the teal component really hard, whap, against the other end, and it would rip that component out of the bone. I thought about putting some surgery videos on here to show you how it worked, but I thought maybe people wouldn't appreciate that. Um, but so imagine you have a, a stem put up your femur, and it's stuck in there really tight. You could take this hammer, the teal part is some nice big heavy piece of steel, and pop it out, okay? So it's like a hammer, but in reverse. So this is the assembly we have. It has three parts. There is the, the slap itself, so the teal piece. There is the shaft that it rides on and, and the end strike plate. Um, and then there is a green cross pin here, okay? And that pin just simply holds those two pieces together, but allows them to slide up and down. Does that make sense to everybody? It's a kind of basic function of this thing? Okay. So we'll look first at a print of uh, the outside handle, okay? It's just a tube, right? It's a cylinder with a hole down the middle. Pretty simple thing, but there's a number of things to notice on this print. So um, first of all, you have uh, several different views of this part. So you can see it's a cylinder and it has some length. Um, and you can see I've got this other view that is hashed, right? And then we have some notes down here in the bottom. And then there's this title block down here in the side, okay? And we'll go through each of those. So starting at this view up here, this is our base view, okay? So learning how to read prints like this is very important. I know it can seem a little tedious, but if you go and look at a print for a part, you have to manufacture this or have to understand someone else communicating it to you. Um, it really helps to understand what you're looking at. So you'll have a base view, and in, in this case, this is the base view looking down the end of this. Um, so it's called front view. It's a two to one scale, so that tells you what the scale is on the paper. And then there are a couple of dimensions to notice. So you've got this diameter across the outside, which I have at 25 and a half. This little symbol right here means diameter. And then there are these two little numbers beside it, and those are tolerances, okay? So whenever you um, specify this part as being 25.5, we'll say that's millimeters in this case, 25.5 um, millimeters, you can't say 25.5 millimeters exactly, because that's <laughs> unmanufacturable, right? You have to say, is 25. 500001 enough, or can it go up to 25.8? What is that limit? Where am I at in my tolerance, okay? Um, and there's two numbers because you have an upper tolerance, how much will I allow you to add, and a lower tolerance, how much will I allow you to subtract? So those numbers simply mean you can add the upper number or you can subtract the, the lower number and I'll still accept this dimension, okay? So if you give me this part, I take a pair of calipers, measure across, and it says 25.8, then your uh, 0.3 millimeters too big. I allowed one, so I'd accept the part. Does everybody understand that idea of a tolerance? Okay. Uh, important concept. So, so moving away, you have projected views. So that's taking the base view and just rotating it downward into the, into the plane, okay? So in this base view, a couple of things to notice. Um, this hashed line right here indicates that I'm doing a section view. So when you're doing a section view, you take that line in the paper and you cut it in half and you open the side up, okay? And that's what you see in the, in the view over here. With the hashed area or the, the marked area here indicates what would be solid in that view. And the, the open area indicates what would, there would be no solid surface on that section. So if you imagine you cut the cylinder in half along this line, you would have an open lumen on the inside and then solid walls on the outside. Make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, and then you'll always put a letter on each end of those views and then name the section view with those letters so that people know what section they're looking at when they read your part. Um, again, you have um, dimensions here. In this case, there is no tolerance on this dimension. That doesn't mean it has to be 100 exactly when you manufacture it. What that means is you would use the default tolerance that's going to be on the title block down here. Okay. Uh, and you do that so that you're not cluttering your print up with a lot of tolerances when you're using a default tolerance across. Okay. So this is another projection view. So in this case, you can see because it's to the right of the main view, it's just taking that tube and laying it on its side um, to the right. 
do that so you can indicate the size of the, of the channel here. You can put a radius. There are two radiuses, so we have marked radii. Um, so you have marked two times, so you know both of those are the same, and you have a tolerance band there as well. If you were really savvy in your uh, print reading, you would notice that I did not dimension where this is off either end of this part or off the center. So I could put this thing dead in the center, and you'd still have to accept this part because I didn't specify. So do you see how having a print gives you control, right? So if you sent this to someone and they sent you back this part, and that wasn't in that perfect orientation in that location, you couldn't really have grounds to complain because you didn't indicate where you wanted it. Okay, does that make sense? So you want to make sure you specify all the dimensions that you care about in your part. So here's our section view. This is helpful for showing things like internal dimensions. So here I have a chamfer on the inside of this. You couldn't really see from the outside. Um, or you may have a lot of complex geometry on the inside of a part, and a section view helps you to see those things that are hidden from the external views, okay? Uh, and then the title block, this is something that would be standard in all prints that you did. Uh, pretty much all CAD software will have some generic ones. So if you're making one on your own, you can put your own you know, name, project name, things like that in it. Um, you'll indicate who created the part, when it was created, the date. Um, and then there's usually a default scale in here. And then how many sheets. So you may have multiple sheets for the same part if you have a lot of information to convey. Okay? And then the last piece in there was, let me jump back. Um, Nope, too far, was the, the notes down here. So on a part level, the notes are usually um, to tell you how you're treating this part. So I, I said in my title block that this thing is, or sorry, in my notes here, it's made of 17-4 stainless steel. So that tells me what type of material, but not what secondary treatments I've done to it. So here I'll say I'm going to do a heat treatment to change the hardness, um, some precipitation hardening. And then here's the surface finish. I'm going to do a fine ceramic and a glass bead blast. So you would define what those things are in your work instructions and give someone the, the instructions on how to do that, okay? So this is, again, where you can control your part, okay? If you don't want a simple machine to finish on the part, if you want it to be polished or blasted or you know, some finish on the outside, which may affect the aesthetics or it could affect the function of the part, right? If you have two pieces that have to interact, you're changing what the friction is between them, uh, things like that. So that's where you get some control over those parts. Uh, the next step from there would be to create an assembly print, okay? So the first print we looked at was a single part print. You're looking at one part and the dimensions of that part. An assembly print is very similar, except you're looking at how those parts go together, how they interact. Does that make sense? So a lot of familiar parts here. You have a set of notes in the bottom. You have a title block. There's a base view and projection views. You can do section views just like you did with the individual part. The thing you'll add is a bill of material up here, and that's a bill of material just for this assembly. So that's not to replace the bill of material for your whole product, but it's just for this one assembly to say, when you go to assemble this, first thing you need to do is get these parts. You'll usually have uh, a number for the parts, so you can indicate what part is what number in your drawing. And then there'll be a revision level for the parts. So if you update the design of the handle but leave everything else the same, you would revise the handle piece to revision B and you'd create a new assembly print. And that way when you go to make this part, you know exactly which the most recent assembly print should have the most recent uh, update to those. And that can be really important when you have products that last a long time, right? If you're working on a product that's 10 years old, you may have gone through a lot of updates in that product, but some of the key parts may stay the same. So you need to know which parts are updated and which parts are not, okay? Very helpful bit of information. Um, so there's that bill of material. Um, in this case, my, my notes for an assembly uh, tend to be about how you put the part together. Okay, this is how you can instruct someone on the sequence of steps to put this part together. Um, the other way you could do this if it's really complex is to create a separate work instruction and say reference work instruction number, you know, whatever for this part. Um, but if it's a simple assembly, you can do your assembly right here. So I say insert item two into item one, press fit item three into item one, uh, or through item one into item three so that item two cannot be removed from item one. That sounds like a mouthful, but when you look at the view, you say, okay, I'm going to um, press fit item three, which is my pin, through item one, so through the hole there, into item two. So that means I'm going to have a, a fit with that pin that I can press it in with force and it won't come back out. Right? It's a fric the friction will hold it in. Um, so that it cannot be removed from item one. So then I have a check built in. Right? I should not then be able to pull 
item one off of item two. Uh, and then the last one was item two should slide freely. So you know, after I've done all this assembly, I still should be able to pull this shaft back and forth for that hammer action. Does that make sense? So this is just ways for you to control how all these things come together. I know that it seems really tedious. Um, it's much more fun to go out and do the creative brainstorming, creating prototypes, all that stuff. But if you want to be able to take that work that you've done and make it matter to the world, you have to be able to do this, right? So you have to be able to communicate design and have it manufactured. So it's not the sexy part of engineering by any stretch, but it's the part that takes products from a cool idea that you had and you built one and one person used to products that are out in the market and you are sold by the thousands and millions, right? So that's some of the key to, to reading an assembly print. Any questions on how to read a print? I know it's mundane. Everybody still awake? Sort of? Good. OK. Um, so now we're going to get into a much more interesting topic, tolerance analysis. Ooh. Uh, you guys, if you guys thought that was boring, you'll love this part. I promise. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, how to make sure that as you create these parts and you put those tolerances on the part, that you know for sure, as you mass produce those parts, that you can pick up one pin one handle and one shaft and they'll all go together, okay? So if you're making millions of parts, you can't check each one, right? You have to be able to have some knowledge that these things are gonna go together. Even worse, when you're assembling something outside of your factory, you wanna know that they go together. So as a good example, when we would do instrumentation um, in, in our um, knee arthroplasty, total knee replacement, the surgeon would assemble the implant in the OR while the person has their knee cut open. So you as an engineer really wanted to know that those parts would work together every single time for that surgeon in the OR so that they weren't sitting there trying to, you know, like think about assembling IKEA furniture while somebody's bleeding on a table, right? So uh, you, want to know, you want to know that it's going to go better than that. Uh, the most simple way to do that is to do a, a tolerance stack up, a simple geometric tolerance stack up. Now there are very refined and elegant ways of doing this for mass production that are a lot more complicated and involve a lot of statistics. I won't bother you with those, so I'll teach you the simplest way, and then if you get into this field, you can learn a little bit more, okay? But at least you'll know how to do a very basic analysis. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple of things. One is called maximum material condition, and the other is called least material condition. This is sort of the very common sense way to go about these, and the math is simple, so don't worry. There's a calculus class in here before us. You won't need any of that, okay? So a couple of the concepts. Um, you have a nominal fit, right? So we had our, the, the red part here would be our handle and the yellow part would be our shaft, right? So the nominal fit would be some amount of gap. I want it to slide, it shouldn't be line to line. The maximum fit will be looking at the very biggest I'll allow the shaft to go and the very smallest I'll allow the hole to go, okay? So think about the most material you could have on the shaft. If you add to the diameter, it would be bigger. On the hole, if you subtract from the diameter, it's bigger, right? more material, right? Smaller hole would be more material. Um, so you're gonna look at the pockets at the minimum. You're gonna look at pads or at extrusions in your model at the maximum, okay? Least material condition is the opposite. And that condition, so in maximum material condition, what you're looking for is interference. Is it too big to fit? Least material condition, you're looking for how much slop is there in the interface, right? Is it gonna flop around? And so you're gonna look at your pockets at their biggest, so you're gonna add the tolerance to the hole, and you're gonna subtract the tolerance from the shaft, okay? So you're gonna look at the, the most wiggle you would allow. Usually it's pretty straightforward how to calculate or how to assume what you'll allow the maximum material to be. You don't want interference, right? That's usually pretty straightforward, unless you're intentionally wanting an in interference fit. Like when I talked about that press fit, you want interference. Um, least material condition takes a lot more intuition or analysis to figure out how much you'll allow, okay? because it's not as simple as looking for when they don't touch anymore because you could allow as much gap as you wanted here, but at some point um, the function would be compromised. So you have to have enough knowledge of your product or do enough analysis of your product to know at what point that slop would be too great. So we'll look at um, sort of basic, a basic setup here. So uh, like I say, the, the math here is really complicated. So we're gonna look at this marker work. We've got this shaft, this marker is outstanding. Um, and we're gonna give it a diameter. In this case, we'll just call it 10 nominal, okay? 
And then, can everybody see that okay? Is it big enough? Okay. Um, so we'll say 10 nominal, and then we'll say we have an upper tolerance of shaft upper and a lower tolerance of shaft lower, okay? So this is kind of a common way to, to annotate these. So SU would be the upper tolerance, SL would be the lower tolerance. So SU is what you can add to that diameter, SL is what you could subtract. Likewise, in the handle, you've got a hole and let's, let's give it a nominal uh, dimension of 10.5. And then we'll have a whole upper and a whole lower. Okay, everybody follow that? So I've given the, the shaft uh, diameter dimension, the interior of the hole uh, dimension, and we're going to look at what those parameters can be and have this still function properly, okay? So the first one to look at would be maximum material condition. This is usually the most important one because you're looking to avoid interference green assembly. So at a different pen, maximum material condition, we would say we want um, the diameter of this pen, so 10 plus the upper tolerance, right, SU, to be less than or equal to 10.5, which is the nominal di dimension of the hole, minus the lower tolerance. Okay, does everybody follow that? Yeah? Okay, so we're looking at the condition where if these are equal, they're going to be line to line, right? It won't go anymore. So anything greater than equal, uh, you would have interference. So simple math, you're going to say, all right, so I know that um, the upper tolerance plus uh, of the shaft plus the lower tolerance of the hole at the very maximum could be equal to 0.5, right? So we're just, we're going to get rid of the less than because we're just looking at that, that borderline case where it's going to start to interfere. Um, so we know that the sum of those is 0.5. Now, in your math classes, you would need one more equation to be able to solve this. In this case, you're the engineer, you can choose, okay? I know from my experience that it's a lot easier to hold the diameter of a hole than it is to set the, the diameter of that shaft, right? The hole I'm gonna drill, it's a very precise operation. The shaft, I'm gonna have to turn on a lathe. Um, so it's gonna be a lot more difficult to hold. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I won't let you go um, any bigger at all on the hole. So I'll set HL equal to zero. And that lets me know for sure that SU is equal to 0.5. Everybody follow that? So then on your print, when you go to specify these, you know, if you set those two as those tolerance pieces, you'll never have interference between these two parts. At the very worst, they would be line to line. And that may or may not be acceptable to you in, in practice, okay? Does everybody understand how you get there? All right. Similarly, at least material condition, you're gonna be looking to say, all right, what's the biggest hole that I will allow with the smallest shaft so that the thing isn't too floppy, right, for my purposes? Um, so I'll say, um, in this case, the quantity of 10 and a half, and I'm looking at the biggest hole, so the hole upper, minus the quantity of 10, the diameter of the um, shaft, minus its lower tolerance. So the difference between the size of this one at its biggest and the size of this one at its smallest um, should be, um, I'll say, less than um, one, okay? So I'm gonna use one as, I've done some analysis and figured one is the sloppiest I'll allow this thing to be, right? So then I gotta figure out what can HU and SL be such that I never get bigger than one. Um, so again, really mind-numbing math. Um, I'll have 0.5 um, plus the upper tolerance plus the lower tolerance 